Well, thanks everyone. First of all, I want to congratulate John on 25 years and everyone else that's been affiliated with AGCI and very much looking forward to the next 25 and also I want to thank the workshop um, organizers for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here and seeing some old friends and getting to meet a lot of new folks. Um, and I guess in the spirit of the meeting of both looking forward and backward in terms of um, global change um, research and science, I wanted to look back to a talk that um, Steve Snyder, who had you know, very much a, a non-zero impact on AGCI, um, gave back in 1996. Um, and it's, it's very important, and so I hope that we would revisit this, because for me, sadly, I only saw it earlier this summer. And as I was considering my own transition, which I'll get into, from being a scientist into being a scientist advocate, this type of, of advice or this type of guidance would have been very valuable. Um, but in all fairness, I did not seek it out because I didn't realize that some of these, um, these talks and papers were out there. But I hope that you know, we, we think less about the answer to this question, is it yes or no? I think I've convinced myself that it's probably no, but I still oscillate back and forth. But I think the value is in actually having the discussion around the question. So younger scientists, even mid-career scientists who are considering this transition, there's a lot of important information considerations here. So I'm hesitant to break my career thus far down into an, simply an XY plot, but I'll do that for this talk. Uh, here there on the x-axis, there's my career timeline, which is about 15 years so far. There's the then and the now. And on the y-axis is this very non-quantitative policy relevant metric. And then up here you see it becomes policy prescriptive. So in grad school, I basically hit this very innocent molecular cluster with photons. Um, I determined what colors or wavelengths it absor absorbed and how it fell apart. And this may sound very science for science sake, but most of you, probably without knowing it, were engaged in this sort of research this morning when you added sugar to your coffee or splendor or whatever. So really what this is doing is looking at the very fundamental process of solvation on a molecule by molecule basis. But I've pulled it just for visual aspects off of the zero on policy relevant, but I think it is indeed zero in terms of its <laughs> policy relevance. So moving up, this is me in the nose cone of a B-57 in Costa Rica. Uh, so I was working on a NASA field mission that my instrument looked at basically how aerosols are processed in the tropical tropopause layer, which has implications for cloud formation and climate impact. So our holy grail here was, for those of you who have looked at clouds, we're finding subvisible cirrus, of which we didn't find very much. Um, but moving along, um, Jeff, you mentioned Susan Solomon as a mentor. Um, I have to add her to my list as well because she knew that my interest in doing more policy relevant science, so she took a chance on an experimentalist that had no background in modeling. And I joined her group and started doing more policy relevant global climate modeling. So this is one paper we looked at looking at the, the, the longer persistence of a warming signal um, compared to the lifetime of um, various forcing agents in the atmosphere. So this starts to explicitly mention policy, but it's not prescriptive. So I'm still below this, what I'll call a bright line. So seemingly on a very smooth transition, I then went to work for a Union of Concerned Scientists in Washington, D.C., where I was now explicitly not only doing science, but advocating for solutions based on that science. So here, this is some work we did on dangerous heat. I won't go into details, but um, we ended up publishing this in a journal, but when you move into this new mode of communication, as Susan got into, it becomes much more visual. So this curvy line in the fit no longer speaks for itself. You need to add the St. Louis arch so people say, oh, wow, this is my hometown. And then getting into the worry, we also do the hope as well, but this is clearly a, a worried mother whose kid has become dehydrated in a dangerous summer day in St. Louis. So this is something that you would never see in JGR, but is quite commonplace in more publicly facing uh, reports that are meant for not only the general public, but policymakers as well. And for various reasons, I've come back down below that line and now work for Climate Central, where we're not policy prescriptive. We don't advocate for anything in particular, aside from 
clearly communicating the relevant science, but science that is still policy relevant. And this transition was not as smooth as I thought it would be. So I kind of thought there was a very bright line, and I, I didn't realize, but I didn't realize my bit, so to speak, would be flipped from a zero to a one, so going from a scientist directly to an advocate. But that's what I felt like. It's really more kind of a superposition, I guess, some sort of qubit state where I was both. But I didn't realize that initially, and it was very troubling making that transition. So Gavin Schmidt gave a talk at AGU in December. Some of you may have been there. I know Don was because he introduced Gavin. Um, yes. Yeah. And he, uh, he, Gavin gave a pop quiz to the audience. So I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I'll go through it myself. So really, the way Gavin formulated it is, what would you feel comfortable saying in public? So for me, scientists should communicate more about what they find and do. Sure, I think I would have said this at any point in my career. I think there's a responsibility if the public's funding our research that we communicate that back to them in venues outside of technical journals and conferences that they will never attend. So I'm OK with that. Funding for scientific research should be higher. Sure, I'm on board with that. Job security. Um, and most of the cases, good science requires sufficient funding. People should understand the basics of the greenhouse effect. Yes, um, and that's not coming from any sort of value-laden position. It's just knowing about our Earth. We learn about earthquakes, the seasons. This is part of how our Earth system functions, so that seems fair. Uh, global warming should be high school science curriculum. I've always thought this topic would make an excellent capstone course for, say, a senior in high school because it does cut across so many different disciplines. It shows you how you know, multiple scientific disciplines, topics can really be interrelated. So I would be for that. Geoengineering should be seriously considered. I, I would definitely not have said that pre-UCS. I still, as formulated here, probably would not say this. Um, there should be a price on carbon emissions. I worked on social cost of carbon, so I would be on board with that. And the only solution to global warming is nuclear power. I, I'm not there. <laughs> um, and I definitely would not have said that pre sort of science advocacy. But as Gavin points out, these are all actually normative statements. There are, and the, the key is there are shoulds are the dead, dead giveaways. So there are lots of shoulds and implied oughts here. So whether you realize it or not, a lot of people are actually involved in advocacy. Maybe it's not overt, maybe it's not conscious, but by going out sometimes and talking about your science, asking for more funding, you're advocating in some way, whether you know it or not. So let's get back to Steve's talk from 96. With this in mind that maybe the advocacy community is a bit bigger than we thought, um, it's worth going back to his talk and seeing how he says we should engage with this. And he terms it responsible advocacy. So the first is uh, know your values. This seems simple, but I don't find myself doing a lot of self-reflection on my values, so it's kind of this nebulous cloud that's always hovering around, but it really is a good exercise to kind of drill down and, and kind of more, you know, formalize those a bit more. Uh, make them explicit, that's a bit easier when you're in the advocacy, advocacy world because when you enter into an office, your, your values are, they're written all over you just by virtue of what organization you're working with, what you're coming in to talk about. It's a little trickier when you're, you know, a, an impartial scientist giving a public talk, um, making any values you have explicit. Uh, don't let your priors distort, or don't let your values distort your priors. Steve gave the example of when he was editor at um, Climatic Change, he got in a paper from someone who did not share his, his paradigm, and his example was, aha, I'm gonna send this to X reviewer who's going to nail this person, and he said, no, I can't do that. I'm falling into this trap. And then defend your values separately um, from debates on probabilities and consequences. This is actually tough, especially in some of the venues I've been in where it's a very short media interview. It's a 20-minute um, meeting with a staffer on the Hill. This really has you kind of switching hats back and forth and switching them clearly. And I think this is actually pretty tough and something I need to work on um, a bit more. And this is another more recent formulation, um, just to show you that some folks are still thinking about what Steve started. So this was published in Frontiers, since we're using Frontiers as much as we can, on ecology and the environment in 2010. 
Uh, so this sort of makes sense. You can see that they probably read or saw Steve's talk because they mentioned about making your values explicitly um, evident. Um, avoiding hyperbole, that, that kind of getting into these, these visuals that connect with emotions, this can be a bit tough. I'm going to get into a few of the challenges I faced while being a scientist advocate. And this is actually really tough. Um, I, would, I would word this more strongly that you really do need to try to stay precisely within your, your technical expertise. And don't even, even expressing that you're venturing beyond that, I feel you should not go there. And this is probably a discussion for another day, but they also, reading the fine print, delineate science-based advocacy from advocacy-driven science. And initially, that seems like a very clear distinction between the two, but I think this is actually very unclear. And I've probably engaged in this just by virtue of how I design my experiments, what topics I choose to look at. But I don't think there's anything nefarious if it's done correctly. <laughs> so my challenges in the two and a half years I was doing this, um, I think I said this to myself around Vail Pass on Sunday. Um, so I'm going to attribute it to me, but I'm sure others have said it in various ways. Um, th this, this idea that there is, there's established expertise, that there is objective knowledge out there. Um, when you give your AGU 12 plus 3 minute talk, um, people may challenge you on some of your results, but they're listening to you. You're brought in and your expertise at some level is acknowledged, where when you jump into the advocacy ring, you're choosing a team. You're choosing a team that shares your values. And in any good team sport, there's an opposition. And I, you know, it's it's going to be no surprise to many in the room. But the other team has their own experts, has their own science in some cases. And this was really brought up very early in my life in D.C. Going to, I think it was a Senate hearing where I won't name names, but someone very clearly laid out in in some detail how crop yields are projected to be impacted by temperature. And uh, the other witness, you know, he, he or she was asked, you know, do you, do you agree with this? Is this sound science? And they said, no, it's not. Crops will be just fine. So for someone outside this field, someone watching on C-SPAN, it really is two different sciences arguing with each other. So two minutes, OK. Uh, speaking only to your expertise, climate casts a, a big shadow under the umbrella, so it's very easy to um, go down roads, um, especially when you're one of the few climate scientists on staff. You're expected to cover a lot of ground. So I, I think this kind of erodes some of the expertise by venturing out onto other limbs. Uh, broader community challenges. Uh, Steve mentioned a double ethical bind. This gets into, again, what Susan was saying about simplifying and clearly communicating, which I agree with. This is some climate central work I did where we showed trends in western wildfires. You know, it's highly aggregated. We put, you know, kind of the average temperature. There's a nice correlation story. But there's much more to it. So the double ethical bind, as I understand it, is there's an obligation to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, lay out all the assumptions, the caveats, and all that. But it actually can dilute the message and ruin the effectiveness of the information you're trying to convey. So this is a recent um, study from Phil Dennison where he essentially does the same thing we did. But he shows some more of the details. So it's still this overall trend like we were seeing. But he does show that it's not uniform across the board. So he is getting into it's the same message. And it can be messaged the same. But it allows for a bit more of the caveat. So for instance, you know, oh, I live in LA. And we're not seeing you know, these increases. And yeah, Mediterranean California is not showing the overall trend. So it's just a way to avoid the broad brush strokes when you can but retain the message. So I think this is a challenge, not only for me personally, but for the global change community, since you only have to look at a Bretherton diagram. It's a complicated field. This is a very simple statement, but make information local. Decision makers want to know what's going on in their own backyard. They want to know how their constituents are being affected. And when scientifically appropriate, of course, but really this is a challenge for, I think, the global change community as well, is thinking about you know, really how to make this, this relevant on scales that people care about. OK, so quickly, uh, there are some options for those that want to make this transition. Uh, this is the, I couldn't find an Otto Leopold Fellowship picture, so I just put a photo of the man himself. 
AAAS, AGU has a science policy. And also there are some explicit um, articles popping up in the literature that really describe this process. So finally, um, so I originally had, I, I think a role for AGCI in the community is helping to guide, I originally had scientists, but I realize this is not for everyone. So the willing scientists, the scientists who are interested in making this transition from the realm of is to ought. So this is David Hume who first formulated this problem. Uh, so I think this is really this, this idea of, of is it an oxymoron? How can this transition be made by those that are interested? It's a really important topic for us. And I'll leave you with one. This is one reason I put David up here. Um, another um, Steve anecdote. Um, I saw him give a climate talk at NCAR a few years ago. I don't remember what it was on. But his offhand, you know, off, his kind of dismissal comment that he said just in passing really stuck with me. And he bemoaned the fact that more scientists aren't trained in the philosophy of science. They're not required to take courses. So this very simple offhand statement really stuck with me. So this is one way Steve had an influence on me because I've really gotten interested in the philosophy of science and how it can affect the work we do. So if anyone is similarly interested and wants to talk more about this, please find me at the break or at the happy hour. So I will leave it there. Thanks. This is one I've found to be uh, something of a problem, that sometimes scientists are too constrained about what their area of expertise sure. might be. I mean, I, like Susan, I, I recommended I actually worked with a group of journalists very carefully in a lot of off-the-record discussions, and I, I, I can always back up, you know, as you moved outside your expertise by getting, going, getting, back, to, getting back to them on, on certain issues. But I think we, we have to really examine this much more carefully, because Recently I heard a, a crop scientist talking about the, the dramatic loss of yields we're going to have, but was not prepared to link that to food security. Mm -hmm. Now, it, mm -hmm. he should be one of the unwilling. Yeah, and I agree with you. And like, I kind of have, have this bright line theme running throughout. It, it's a line for that each person needs to decide how comfortable they are. So I, I completely agree. And it's also venue dependent. So when you're working in the background with, and you have time to back up and say, well, Let's, let's try a different direction. That works. But if you're in the heat of the moment of an interview, it's really easy to say, I'm not an economist, but I will say this. And then you, I found myself doing that. And I have to back up. And it, it's hard to do. It's hard to check yourself. But sometimes it, it, it really needs to be done. So. Okay. Tom and David. Uh, David Rose, a distinguished nuclear yeah. scientist and engineer back in the 70s and 80s, used to say, just because we're scientists does not mean that we give up our responsibility to speak out as citizens. And he said, sometimes we need to be prepared to say things that come out of our conscience as citizens, even if they go beyond what we're sure is true right. as scientists. The challenge is to figure out how to, to make clear which hat you're wearing yes. when you speak out. Yeah, and Steve mentioned that in his talk, and others have as well, is that if, if you <coughs> are venturing outside of your area of expertise, and <coughs> You need to you need to acknowledge that, and if it's if you're venturing out because of some sort of values you're holding, you need to make those explicit as well. It's tough. It's again I mentioned needing to switch hats quickly and seamlessly, and that's that's a challenge. Well, most often where we end up doing that is not in public statements, but in one-to-one -one conversations with policymakers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been to some in district meetings and meetings on the hill where, especially in quote unquote friendly offices, it's easy to start ad-libbing and, and getting off message and um, it's, it's, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done and it can be constructive, but it's something to really be mindful of because it can get you in trouble. Anyway, I think this, we're probably all in broad agreement about this, I think it's very important that we indicate where we are speaking from deep expertise, where we're informed but this is not our realm of expertise. And it's intrinsic to a topic like this that, that there's going to be a lot of areas of this, this larger umbrella. I think that it's very important that we, that we do that, especially when you're doing, doing extended interviews with reporters and so on. It, it creates a, a, a muddier message, of course, but they're calling you because you're an expert in some domains, right. not necessarily all others. And I think that, that helps explain why this crop sign is probably, I wasn't there, but 
Um, if, if I were an expert on crop yields, I would, but not an economist who really understands the global food trade system and pricing, I would be very reluctant to speak about the impact on, on food security because huge crashes in crop yields don't necessarily lead to food insecurities because of substitution effects and larger, broader markets and human responses to that and so on. So I think that's actually very, very important for us. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I wasn't there, so I can't criticize the guy who wasn't here and we're on video, so <laughs> But I just, you know, that these systems, especially as they, these markets have become global, these systems respond in ways that are very hard for us when we take a kind of technical or physical approach to studies of 